What happens when we die? Do we go to heaven or hell? In this video, we'll learn about death and its origins and to know why Jesus died on the cross. If you ask people, why did Jesus die on the cross? You will probably get different answers. Some may say that it is a sacrifice related to man's sin and God's wrath, mercy, and forgiveness. Others may focus on a cosmic victory where Jesus' death somehow transcends death itself. And others may say that Jesus had to die, or that God sent him to die, or that the death of Jesus is the ultimate example of devotion, a concrete image of his deep love for us. The crucifixion of Jesus in itself is not easy to explain, and each answer raises even more questions, each of which requires deeper wisdom and understanding. We will have a hard time understanding Jesus' death if we don't think about why we ourselves die. Why do we die? Why do our hair turn gray and our skin get wrinkly? Why do we all eventually die and return to dust? In Genesis chapter 1, God speaks his good creation into existence. And in Genesis chapter 2, we see the difference between two key states of creation, the whole world and the world in the unique garden that God plants in Eden. The garden is like God's home, a picture of heaven on earth, where God walks with people and shares with them his endless, blooming life as companions. And because God is the infinite source of life, the garden is an immortal zone. There is still beauty, goodness, and life in the world outside the garden, but it also has an expiration date. Unlike the garden, living things come out of the dust and go back into it. They die. It is interesting that God first creates man outside the garden, in the land of dust. In Genesis 2 verse 7 shows that God forms Adam, which means man, in Hebrew, from the word Adama, which means earth, clay, or dust, from the substance of the earth. After forming Adam and breathing life into him, God plants a garden and places man in it. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 and 15, when man is in the garden, God offers a choice. People can live with him in the garden forever, or they can stop living with him in the garden and return to the dust, Adama. The right choice seems obvious. Why would anyone leave? The story in Genesis shows God planting two trees that represent these life or death options. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. Eating from the tree of life means trusting God's wisdom, thereby living forever with him and according to his instruction. However, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad means trusting in human wisdom, thereby rejecting God's instruction and in life. If you eat from that tree, God says, you will surely die. In Genesis 2.17, the humans probably never intended to leave the garden, but they didn't take God's word seriously and trusted the wisdom of a serpent deceiver instead of God. After making the wrong choice, the human is sent out of the garden, back to the place he was originally formed, the ground from which he had been taken. In Genesis 3.19, the human must now live outside the garden where people wrinkle and turn gray and eventually die on their way back to dust. The main message of the story of Eden is this. People die because we rejected God's offer of ultimate life from the beginning. God's offer requires giving up what we may think is life in order to receive the real life that God wants to give us. Tragically, we often choose life as defined by our own wisdom and accept our own self-destruction. Often these choices seem as innocent as eating delicious and beautiful fruit. In Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and that the tree was desirable for wisdom, she took off its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate. But when these choices are contrary to God's wise instructions, they corrupt life and bring death. It is hard to say that Jesus died for us. The first followers of Jesus describe his death with different emphases and nuances. As you gather the list, you will notice various summary statements, as well as the use of the common phrase in all these scriptures, Jesus died for us. That seems simple enough, but it can still leave us to wonder, for us, how? In the New Testament, the term, we, uses one of two Greek words. The first, huper, is usually translated as the English word, for. But huper can convey several shades of meaning, including for the benefit of, in place of slash instead of, as a representative of, or because of, for the reason of. When these writers say that Jesus died for us, using one of these two Greek words, do they mean that Jesus died for people? Or that he died in place of the people, implying that he died as a substitute? Or is it said that he died because of people, because of what we did, or what we did to him? Or is it because of his love for people? Could it be all of the above? Perhaps he died for us in all these ways and more. The Apostle Paul helps narrow our focus when he says in 1 Corinthians 15.3 that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. 
he refers to the biblical background. And since the collected New Testament did not exist in Paul's time, it was in the process of being written, we know that he was talking about the Hebrew Scriptures. Is death our end? God not only drives people out of Eden, but also places two cherubim and a deadly flaming sword at the gate of the garden to prevent them from re-entering. God describes this as fervent grace that keeps people from living in a corrupt state forever. But this creates a paradox in the story. From the book of Genesis, we know that God's plan is to oversee creation in close cooperation with humans who are made in God's image. But how can that be, when the only way to restore people to eternal life is to pass those fiery angels with the sword, death? If this were the end of the story, it would be the ultimate tragedy, for God seems to have completely severed ties with humanity. But we are only in chapter 3. History has just begun, and it quickly becomes clear that God does not leave his fellow men in the grave. Since humans cannot return to Eden on their own without dying, God establishes another path that points to the final solution. When God leads the Israelites to Mount Sinai, he gives instructions for the portable tabernacle or tent where God will bring Eden home to his people. Then comes the temple in Jerusalem where God graciously does the same. And finally, God brings his infinite life as close as possible becoming human in Jesus of Nazareth. All these movements say that God is not interested in giving up his partnership with humanity. Rather, God joins us in the dust, showing us that true life is oneness with God and that our death is a temporary tragedy, not our final destination. Why did Jesus die? The opening lines of John's Gospel offer a cosmic plot twist. The infinite creator God of space, unchangeable, unfathomable, Invincible joins us in our corrupt and dying state outside the garden. We are told that God makes his abode, that is, his dwelling among us, becoming man and joining us outside Eden. When God chooses to be with us, he also chooses to die. In this sense, Jesus dies because we die. The early backstory of the Hebrew Bible in the early chapters of Genesis shows us that reunification with God and return to eternal garden life requires actual death. Remember the symbols of the cherub and the flaming sword. And remember that the mortal return to the garden means giving up our definitions of good and evil that lead us to death. Through the animal sacrifices of the tabernacle and temple rituals, God tells his people that he intends to unite with them and save their lives through death. Now God becomes a real man and experiences the same death. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that Jesus became sin for us, although he knew no sin. Jesus takes upon himself the pain and death of all the corrupt flesh belonging to mankind, even though he does not know and will never choose to sin. Here we learn the meaning of the cross. It is God who lovingly gives his human life for us. In Christ, God meets us outside the garden, and by death he crosses the border of the sword of the deadly cherub that guards the way back inside. At the time of Jesus' crucifixion in Jerusalem, shortly after his death, a curtain embroidered with temple cherubs guarded the road. Sanctity is torn in two, from top to bottom. Access to God's presence has been restored. In this sense, Jesus dies to open the way for humanity to return to God. And when Jesus resurrects as the same man, he reveals the well-hidden secret of death. We, rightly, assume that death marks the final end of human life, but the resurrection of Jesus says otherwise. The resurrection of Jesus means that we are his true brothers and sisters and will one day join him in the resurrection life. His death and resurrection cry together. The lifeless and you fear is not real. Let the love of God's lasting way of life replace your fear of death. The fear of death is another deceptive lie that tricks us into hoarding resources instead of living generously. The fear of death deceives us into fighting our neighbors and making swords to kill our enemies. We all live outside the garden and a fear-filled instinct to protect ourselves at all costs is embedded in our DNA. It is inevitable, unless a real person can show us that death is temporary and not final. Another reason Jesus died is to prove just that. And when we pay attention to him, his love slowly but surely removes all fear of death. Instead of hating and condemning, we can begin to forgive and love. We will bless and not curse, forge our violent swords into fruitful gardening tools. Jesus shows us that death is cruelly tragic, but it is not the end. Our lives are strengthened and enlightened as we spend them freely learning about his constant, loving, garden-like life with others. So many thoughts and questions about Jesus' death on the cross still remain. But whatever answers or theories we explore, we can remember that Jesus dies for us in many ways. God demonstrates his love for us, says the Apostle Paul, because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
God's love is most perfectly manifested in the death of Jesus, when God himself enters our world of death and dust, so that in him we can live through death and return to an endless, good life with God. All this and more Paul means when he says, according to the Bible, Christ died for our sins. Jesus died for us because he loves us. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and family.